Welcome to the Rogue Startups Podcast, where two startup founders are sharing lessons learned and pitfalls to avoid in their online businesses. And now, here's Dave and Craig. All right. Welcome to Rogue Startups, episode 171. Mr. Craig, how are you today? Dave, I'm good. Uh, you know, for, for all the podcast listeners out here, this is two days in a row of me and Dave podcasting. Uh, but today we're we joined... Yeah, it's just becoming a nasty habit. Uh, but today we're joined by a special guest, Kevin McArdle. So Kevin, how you doing? I'm great. Good to be with you guys. Awesome. So, uh, so for Kevin, for, those for the know, two gosh. or three people out there that don't know you and what you do, you want to give a quick background on kind of who you are and what you do on the internet? Yes, I am the co-founder and CEO of SureSwift Capital, and we are a holding company. We acquire and operate small technology businesses in perpetuity. Man, you got that elevator pitch down, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing it for four years. I was expecting more, more and I was like... I'm happy to go into more detail, and I guess that's I mean, part wow. of the point. But um, yeah, when you know, it, people still look at our businesses like a little bit weird. So after four years of people asking me like, so what do you do? Um, and not just my parents and family who are completely confused, but people like yourselves who are in the business, in the game, people are still surprised to hear that, you know, we have a company that acquires the businesses like you guys are running. So you get good at the elevator pitch after a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish I could get good at the whole IT pitch when my parents come to say, Hey, Hey Dave, will you come fix our computer? No, <laughs> just throw your hands up. Yeah. And luckily I don't get those calls. So even though I am running a technology company, they call my brother who's a mechanical engineer when they've got computer problems. So I've kind of got the thing wired pretty well. Oh, so jealous. So jealous. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's, let's dive right in then. Uh, let's talk a little bit about SureSwift here. Uh, you know, we've seen you at MicroConf and had conversations, great ones, by the way, uh, multiple times about, you know, what you're doing with SureSwift and what kind of portfolio businesses you acquire. But Let's talk a little uh, about the nuts and bolts here, because one of the things that I don't think we've ever had the discussion about is, like, what you know, what is the operating infrastructure of SureSwift here? What does your team look like? You know, how many businesses are you actually trying to run here? What does everybody do? Are they all like on different things? Are they all on the same things? Do they split their time? Like, what what's the nitty gritty of this? Yeah, all good questions. So let me just take them. Kind of as they come pop into my my head, um, we've acquired 32 businesses in four years, um, and we continue to operate almost all of them. We sold a few that were just really small and ended up being more of a distraction than revenue generators. Uh, so we're currently operating a portfolio of 27 businesses. We have a team of 80 people, literally around the world in 14 time zones. Um, all of whom are exceptionally talented in, in their own rights, but that's everything from you know, software developers, uh, UI, UX designers, uh, customer happiness people who support our customers in our SaaS businesses, uh, marketing folks. You know, and of course, when you get to that size, you have like a HR and finance functions and so forth. But yeah, we've got a really, it's, I'm really proud of the quite large team that we have that have all sort of come together in, you know, not, not your traditional circumstances. So you know, I mentioned we're remote around the world, but you know, when you think of building a company, most people think recruit in your area. And so it's been a really interesting set of learning for me to build a company like that. Like I've managed bigger chunks of other people's companies, but um, to be able to recruit and retain this really talented group of people and make it all work in a remote environment, which I know you guys operate in, but to do so at, at this level of scale has been a, a challenge, but it's been really interesting and fun. One of your other questions of like, what do all these people work on? Um, often, well, almost always, I, I should say, when we acquire a business, we'll keep the team on board. Usually the founder has decided for one reason or another that they're ready to go do something else. Um, or they're just ready to cash in on their business. And there's a number of reasons why people would sell a business and we can get into that. But um, we will always offer to take on their team and em employ them ourselves. And so that has been a great way for us to, you know, some, many of those 80 people came with the businesses that were sold 
of course, the people have their choice whether to stick around with SureSwift or not. And fortunately, our retention rates have been amazing. Then the founder will help us transition the business. And we then make decisions on the business and with the team to decide what are the best opportunities for the business and for the people. So we often have people who have a focus on one portfolio company or another, but then we will, you know, let's say we find a really talented Ruby developer who came to us through an acquisition. And because they're really talented, we have other Ruby projects. So we'll ask them to work on other things. So um, outside looking in, it might look a little bit messy in terms of we got some people that work across the whole portfolio, some people that focus on one portfolio company, some people work on two or three. But when you're in it, those micro decisions generally make sense at the time. And um, the, the people working on different things understand what their role is for the portfolio company and for the, the bigger SureSwift vision at large. So Kevin, one of the things uh, I'm really curious about is I, I think that the, the remote model is pretty well like baked and understood on a I don't want to say smaller level, yeah, smaller level. Like so, so Castos, we're a team of five. Podcast Motor, we're a team of 13. But to get to 80 people, and I think about companies like Buffer uh, or Zapier <laughs> that are these huge single, single kind of entity businesses, but in really large teams, Automatic being another one. Can you can you talk a little bit about like the tools and the processes and maybe things that you've learned the hard way of running a large remote team? Yeah, I'd be happy to share our experiences. I certainly don't consider myself an expert, and in fact, I look up to you know Zapier and Buffer and try to follow those people and and look for ideas on how to continue to do things better. The thing that I had to sort of retrain myself was that you have to be really intentional about culture with a big team that's operating remotely. Um, and it, well, it doesn't even have to be, be a big team. I assume you found that with Castos and Podcast Motor. You can't, I, I, I said in one of our blog posts, you can't just like pull everybody together and ha- for a happy hour on a Friday or, you know, have a Christmas party or, you know, go to a, you know, sporting event and, and bond as a team, you know? Um, so some of the simple things that we do that, well, they, they seem simple, but maybe not obvious to people not working in this environment is, you know, video calls are way better than phone calls and phone calls are way better than um, email or Slack if you want to connect with people. Yeah, as I say that we don't spend, we try to limit meetings in terms of being as productive as we can and working asynchronously. But when you have a topic that you decide you want to have a meeting, our default is video conferencing just because you can you know, read people better. And I think the easy choice is to do a call because then it's, you know, we're all more comfortable, you know, not having people see our facial expression, but that's one of those things that if you want to know about culture, you, you make those sorts of decisions. Um, and I think what's interesting, even though it's a big group and people find it odd that we can be productive with so many people spread around the world, I actually flip it on its head and I, I think we're more productive than any business I've ever worked in because we have to think about, you know, if I want to connect with somebody who's in Tel Aviv, I can't just walk over to her desk and do that. You know, we, you know, if I, if we want to communicate, you know, you think more about your written communication, you think hard about scheduling a meeting because it's really inconvenient for everybody. And actually that that's true. Even if somebody's here in Minneapolis where I live, it's easier for us to schedule a meeting, but that doesn't mean I do it more often because it's still not the most productive use of time. So in terms of tools, you know, we use Zoom for video conferencing. We use Slack. I am actually a huge Slack fan. I feel like there's a backlash against Slack lately in the technology world, but I think people could maybe just take a look at how they're using it and the hygiene around which they're using it and don't use it as an interrupter, but think about how they use it as a communication tool. And so Something that we, so we are, um, unlike Buffer, where, you know, if you talk to, or, or Zapier, or, you know, automatic, you've got a large team of people working on a single mission. We are a team of 80 people working on 27 different products. So we have smaller communities within our Slack um, instance where people can just talk about what they're focused on. We have a lot of private channels, which I think is a bit unusual from what I understand of other Slack, big Slack users. 
Um, but, you know, a private channel related to a specific product. So those people can chat all day long and sort of form their own culture around how they communicate, the hygiene around which they communicate. Is it fun and lighthearted or do they only use it for serious things? And, you know, we've got kind of mini cultures within our larger SureSwift culture. And we provide that flexibility to people like to decide how they best work together within kind of a framework of, you know, how, how we, what, what communication we think is important, what maybe is less important. Um, and, you know, a little bit of ground rules about, um, well, I guess we, we don't have a lot of rules. It's, it's sort of self-organizing culture. Like we use Slack for fun and we use it for serious things and we don't really mandate to people when it should be used for fun or not. It sort of just grew up organically. That's interesting. So it kind of sounds a little bit, uh, so I, you may not be familiar. I have a, a freelance job in addition to the other businesses that I run. And the, the freelance job, we have a bunch of private channels like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I actually, I, I'm, I'm not anti-Slack, but I find Slack very distracting when I'm trying to do focused work. So largely I sort of keep it shut off and then I'll check it at the beginning or the end of the day. But there's a lot of people, especially those that are much younger than I am, get off my lawn, thank you very much, um, that they're all like hanging out there all day and exchanging stuff and talking about articles and, and still doing their work on the side. I just can't, I can't do that. But that sort of builds like individual team cultures exactly like you talked about right there. Mm-hmm. Is there something that sort of brings like are you just the 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 benevolent overlord of everything there or is there actually some cross team thing here where everybody comes together and says all right here's what we're doing over here on this business and here's what we're doing in this business and everybody kind of discusses the issues that they're having and see if somebody else can help them out on it or does this happen you know at the subatomic level what's going on with there yeah, so it's, there's actually a bigger question about how I like to operate. Um, well, throughout my career, but especially Sure Swift, my general principles are hire people way smarter than you, and then stay the hell out of the way and let them make as many decisions as possible. So uh, I'm certainly not a benevolent overlord on much of anything at Sure Swift, um, unless it's like really critical to the culture or the brand and about how we treat people. But generally, because I follow those rules, hire smart people and stay out of the way. Um, it's a really good day if I don't have to make any decisions or you know lean in on any particular topic. So um, to continue the Slack example, we somebody on the team, and to be honest, I can't even remember who it was, or I would shout out that person, suggested a photo Friday as like a you know let's just talk about something that's completely unrelated to work. I'm going to show you a picture of my friend's wedding that I went to, or, you know, one person on my team just posted some really cute Easter pictures with a baby or, you know, we do get a lot of baby pictures and a lot of dog pictures and it's just fun. And it does bring the team together and it's a bit of a distraction. It helps us get to know one another outside of work, which is part of that. Like that is a culture piece that's hard to do when you don't physically see each other. But, um, somebody had the idea of like, let's try to bridge that gap and just post stuff about your life outside of work if you choose to. And if you don't want to, that's cool. Nobody's going to you know, shame you for not participating in Photo Friday. Um, and like I said, we have certain groups who are um, the, the ones that will kind of chit chat all day long. And that's just part of their work culture as a group. And there are others where their Slack channel is relatively quiet unless there's something important going on that everybody needs to discuss. So um, partly it's just my style. And I also think it's a healthier way to do things to let people kind of self-organize and operate how they're comfortable and, you know, try, try to stay out of the way. unless You know, there's something, you know, re- a, a really important reason to get in the way. Did that answer your question, Dave? I think so. I think so. And I'm, I'm like you, like I, if there's something I'm, I really need to focus on, there's a really handy little snooze button in Slack and you don't get the notices. You don't have to look at it. Um, and there's times where I'm, whatever I'm doing is slightly less important and I can multitask and jump in and out of conversations. And so the, some of, some of the backlash against Slack, I think is a bit, you know, maybe just have a little better personal discipline or have a conversation in your company about what is and is not appropriate for Slack usage or what is the reasonable expectation for somebody to reply to you. Um, I feel like it's just, you know, not that complicated. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've recently, with our developers for Castos, we've recently said the developers only get involved in Slack if something needs to be handled that day. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everything goes through Notion, our project management tool, or through Help Scout, our you know, customer service tool. Yeah. And those are asynchronous with a turnaround time of measured in days rather than whatever minutes or hours. And if something is really important, the our support team and myself have the authority now to say, interrupt somebody because it's like, you know, the, the building's on fire, right. uh, interrupt somebody and it's the best thing for the team and the business and all this kind of stuff. Otherwise developers need focus, concentration, deep work time and don't interrupt them in Slack and just give them something where they could go check it twice a day or once a day or something. And that's fine. So yeah, I agree. I think that Slack is overall a really good tool. It is not the place to do work. I think that's their, their slogan. Like it's where work happens. It is not where work happens. <laughs> it, is a it is a communication tool. And, and so Kevin, that, that begs the question. You, the, the thing you didn't talk about is what do you guys do for project management? I mean, like Asana, Basecamp, Notion, Trello, what, what do you guys use to organize like persistent big picture things? Yeah, that's uh, one interesting thing about acquiring companies is people pick all sorts of different tools. And so we get exposed to all of the ones you've mentioned, not by choice. It's like, you know, the team was using this, all the histories in there, let's have a look. And that applies to also our customer support systems. Um, or the term we like to use is customer happiness, because I feel like that sets the bar a little bit higher than customer support, or cost, even higher than customer success, in my opinion. Um, so our current tech stack, and I've asked Jim, who's our VP of technology, to like write up a fulsome post about, here's all the stuff we use and why. So for project management, we currently use Trello, but in the past, we've dabbled in Basecamp, we've dabbled in Asana. We use a tool that I think is slightly less known, but it's called Active Collab. And they're all, they're, they all have their pros and cons. I am fortunate that I don't have to live in these tools very much. So I, this, again, I let the team decide what they think is the most useful. And currently that's Trello. I say currently because you know, we're not committed to that forever, but it's working for us right now. For customer happiness, we unless there's a really good reason why, why we wouldn't do this. And I, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, now we will convert almost any, any company we acquire will convert to help scout. And again, all the different tools have the pros and cons. Our team decided help scout was the most beneficial because as we cross train people and we have somebody managing customer happiness for more than one product or portfolio company, it's easier for them to context switch within help scout because uh, for a while we were operating with you know Zendesk, Freshdesk, Help Scout, on and on and on, and it just got a little uh, crazy for that team to manage the different workflows. I'm trying to think, any other tools that you're wondering about? No, I mean I think that that covers the basics of it. I mean I think there's things like HR and payroll and stuff that are uh, not as interesting. Also, they're all important, <laughs> but yeah, I mean the, the communication, yeah. project management. And, Customer happiness. Uh, I think those are all. It's good to hear. I think Dave and I are using all of those tools, so we're in we're in good company. At least yeah, and one in counter example. I don't know if this is interesting, but um, email is something we have not standardized at all. And I the, again, the team sort of decided and proposed that to take apart the email sequences, both transactional and marketing, that are already built into an intercom or drip or Mailchimp, etc switching costs are much higher to get it tuned yeah. up the way that you want. So that, if you look at our portfolio, is a bit of a, a mess or a mixed bag. But there's, there's a, you know, it's a conscious decision to keep those systems. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think Dave and I are both spread across a couple of different tools right now. And uh, yeah, the switching cost is massive. And we've seen a lot of hubloo in the last couple of months around, you know, different email systems. And yeah, the change is not a trivial thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this episode is going to come out the episode after I talked about, you know, kind of uh, throwing in the towel on Sales Camp, the affiliate marketing tool that I, I kind of was invested in for about a year and recently decided just was too much to run three different businesses. Uh, so kind of doubling down on my podcast related businesses, Podcast Motor and Castos, which for me is as a smaller kind of player in the portfolio space is a good move. It's just, it's all I can handle. 
Um, but for folks who are looking at the portfolio model like you run with SureSwift, what are some things that they should think about before kind of getting into saying, well, yeah, I do one well. Why can't I do two or three or five or 10 businesses well? Both like the, the challenges of having multiple successes, but also like on a day-to-day basis and kind of for like a financial perspective, like what's the difference between running one business well and running 10 or 27 or whatever? It is? Yeah, it's actually a question I get a lot from people in the, the circles that we all run in. Because if, you know, the great thing about a successful internet-based business is they can be super profitable. And then you think, you know, the high class problem, what do I do with these profits? Do I just bank it or can I reinvest it? And often reinvesting in one's own super profitable internet-based business, especially in the bootstrapped context that I know you guys are bootstrappers and most of um, the people I interact with are bootstrappers. Like you don't just get the business to grow by throwing money at it. And that's, that's a good thing. But then people start to think, okay, what could I throw this money at? And well, maybe I'll acquire a business. And that's fine. I, I'm not, I, I would never advise somebody to not do that. But it is um, more complicated than just if you're good at running one business, that doesn't mean you're going to be good at running two or three or a larger portfolio. It's a very different mindset. And so for me, the plan was always to build a portfolio. So I feel like me and my team have proven that we're pretty good at running a portfolio. Um, that doesn't mean that I would be good at running a single business like you guys are. And I have seen a, a, more than a few people who have really successful internet-based bootstrap businesses get themselves into trouble because they went and you know thought, well, I'll go acquire. I'm good at running one business, so I can go acquire another one, and I'll be good at running two. And that acquisition doesn't go as planned. They're out of bunch of capital, the revenue goes down, and their core business that made them all that money is suffering because now they've got you know this you know, dumpster fire that they're trying to either put out or sell or whatever. Uh, and it's a, sh- it's a shame. And um, that, that doesn't mean I would tell people not to do it, but I would say you got to think about what are, you, what are you really good at and what do you love to do? If you're working in something that has those, you know, is in the heart of that Venn diagram, just think hard about like, just don't screw that up. Because that's a, that's a really good place to be and not everybody's there. Um, if you do want to acquire and build a portfolio, you know, it, think of your core business as just one of a number of things. And if, if you still love and want to run your core business, well, maybe you shouldn't do it. Or maybe you should hire somebody to do that before you start looking at acquiring businesses. Because the other thing I tell people is from the start, acquiring businesses and building a portfolio have been my full-time job. I, didn't, I quit my other job to focus exclusively on this. It wasn't a side hustle. And it was still really, really hard as my full-time job. So if you can't dedicate yourself fully to it, then you that decreases your, your chances of success. So I don't know if that answers your question, Craig, but uh, that's just some of the things that I advise people to, to think about. The other, the other piece of advice, I, I also get contacted by a lot of people who will reach out to me via Twitter seems to be the medium of choice. Maybe that's because where I spend my most time, the most of my time, but um, in a, in a social context, like I don't, I don't participate much in LinkedIn, not at all at Facebook. So people find me on Twitter and Hey, let, I'd love to chat. I, we're doing, I'm doing the same thing as you. I'm building a portfolio of businesses and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's often an idea that may or may not have any capital behind it, but you know, they're, they might be reading about people like me or others who are successfully doing this and they're, you know, I'm not the only one in the, in the market, certainly. And I, I don't know, it's starting to feel like um, everybody's new way to make money on the internet is just to buy businesses. And frankly, it scares me that I like knowing that I have professional competitors and uh, without naming names, you know, there are lots of professional competitors out there that people know. Um, but when somebody, it's their, the first business that they're going to acquire or they are pulling together, you know, a bunch of somewhat wealthy people and they're going to charge one guy to, to run this business. I, it just worries me that there's a risk of killing successful businesses by non-professional acquirers getting into the market. And time will tell whether these people are professional or not, but um, I see a lot of people that feel less professional, but trying to take advantage of like a emerging business model 
I guess, well, that's maybe not the best way. To, this business model is as old as the dinosaurs, but um, it's becoming, I see a lot more people sort of working their way into this corner of the internet and thinking they're going to make a bunch of money and it's going to be easy. And having you know lived through this for four going on five years, I can tell you there's nothing easy about it. <laughs> That's for damn sure. The uh, it, what you talk about is sort of a very similar path that I think I've seen with people who got super excited about Flippa when it came out and eBay in the early days when they started doing website sales and everybody thought that they could just buy and sell websites and make millions of dollars doing practically nothing. And then the reality quickly sets in, smacks them upside the head. And they're like, oh, crap, this is actually really hard. And it's not something you can just sort of slap out there and hope for the best because that rarely works. So, I mean, maybe it's just a shaking out time where everybody thinks, ooh, this is the next shiny thing. And, you know, I don't know. Hard to say. Hard to say. But with that said, you kind of hinted at this, but what would you say is the hardest thing about running the portfolio businesses that you have now? Um. Well, one of the, let me, let me phrase it this way. One of the things that I, one of the ways that we've evolved that I'm pretty proud of that was a challenge before, and I'm not to say that we've got it all figured out, but um, creating systems and processes to make sure that every business gets the right attention and nothing falls through the cracks. That was one of the biggest lessons that I had to learn as somebody managing a portfolio because there's always a fire with one business or another, or on a more positive side, there's always one business that is either growing faster or making more money that can easily draw your attention. And rightly so, um, when you're trying to allocate capital or time, you got to make those decisions. But in that can happen at the detriment of some of the other businesses. Uh, And so we've been really intentional about making sure there is a person on the team that is accountable for the health and the growth of every single business that we operate. And it could be that one person is responsible for two or three individual businesses. They're the accountable person. But we know if one business has a bad month, we know who to, who to call, not to, to punish that person, but to ask, okay, what's going on? Do you need help? Are, is, the, is the process and the system failing in some way? Or is it just like, this is life and business happens and not every business goes up into the right all the time. We, so we, we have, we're very disciplined about uh, process and tools and systems to make sure that everything is functioning as it's, as we've designed it. And if there are any exceptions, they tend to bubble up pretty quickly so that it, it's getting harder and harder for things to fall through the cracks at SureSwift. Nice. Nice. So we, we've uh, we've recently kind of rolled out a thing that I like to call a scorecard whack-a-mole okay. uh, for, for Castos, where uh, we, we try to have accountability across the whole business that different people have responsibility. Ultimately, I'm the business owner, so I own all of them, but different people have responsibility for different parts of the scorecard. Mm-hmm. D- can you talk a little bit about how you guys on a whatever regular is weekly or monthly basis evaluate and um, address parts of your, what we call our scorecard to, to make sure that, you know, the business is healthy. Yeah. There's several layers of that. So uh, at a weekly level, myself and my leadership team, there are five of us that get on the phone uh, every Tuesday morning at nine o'clock in the morning uh, for an hour and a half. And we review, we call it our scorecard too, but it's sort of the, the 15 to 20 metrics that we have decided are most important for us to understand the overall health of the portfolio. And we, you know, talk through where things are off course. We decide how to fix them and we solve problems right there on the phone. And I, I, I will also say like that scorecard, I don't know if you found this, Craig, but ours always evolves. Like what feels like a good number of measurement today might feel different in two or three months. And so we, we mm-hmm. let it evolve. Mm-hmm. But the point is to draw focus to the most important things, good and bad. So if something's really good, we try to, dig in and understand, okay, what, what are we doing there that we might not be doing in other portfolio companies that we should try to replicate? Uh, and if something is not going so well, obviously we try to understand that as well. And then it, for each portfolio company, there's a series of um, you know, monthly, more monthly processes. So each team, they communicate on a, on a weekly basis internally to just make sure they're executing on the plans that they've set out. And 
ask for help when they need help. And then monthly, we we look at you know the P&L for each business. We look at the project roadmap. We look at hus- customer happiness scores. And we have systems in place that kind of feed that information to the right people at the right time. And then uh, another thing that maybe is a little bit different that I stole from my old company, every 60 days, we do what's called a deep dive where we look at every aspect of a business in great detail. And the person accountable for that business, the role is a product manager, but they're essentially asked to be the mini CEO of a portfolio company and understand customer happiness, understand the product roadmap, understand the customers and the market itself, have growth strategies, uh, manage the people that are all contributing to that business. And that product manager, every 60 days, puts out a report card on the business that goes through every single aspect of it, you know, traffic, revenue, expense, products, on down the list. It ends up being like a 10 to 12 page document that some of the information is fed to them through systems. And some of it is narrative of them saying, here's what I was trying to do over the last 60 days. Here are the results. And here's what I want to accomplish over the next 60 days. And here are the things I need help with, et cetera. And you know, our, our leadership team plus a few other people get involved in those calls. And so you're never more than 60 days from everybody knowing exactly what's going on with that business. And I found that is, has been a really healthy way for us to operate because in, you know, in contrast to, you know, I, I will applaud you for both uh, Craig running two businesses and trying with a third and then deciding that third is not where your bread is going to be buttered and go focus on the podcast uh, businesses. Those are all really smart and gutsy decisions. And in, you kind of probably know what's going on with podcast motor and castos at any given time, right? you know, to some degree, or you, you, it's easy to ping somebody and find out what's going on. We've, we're managing yeah. a portfolio of 27. Nobody, no human can keep all that in their head. Uh, and so we found through all these different processes and systems and the deep dive uh, process specifically, we're able to get the right information to the right people at the right time and make sure a, that nothing is falling through the cracks and no business can, you know, go off the rails without somebody, without a flag being raised. But just as importantly, all of the people accountable for delivering with those businesses feel like they're supported by the huge infrastructure of SureSwift and that they don't ever feel like they're, you know, on their own to figure things out. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, so I'll just add kind of one little piece here. So I um, give a a monthly update to a handful of people outside of our business, uh, just like a, an email summary of kind of our key metrics. And of a friend that does this to several dozen people, just kind of a, you know, one page email, you know, this is what we did last month, this is what we're going to do the next coming month. And these are two friends and advisors and business colleagues and stuff. So if you're a solo operator, like Dave and myself, you still can have this like introspective deep dive on whatever basis you want and just put it in writing somewhere, share it with people. They're probably not going to read it, but it's a healthy exercise for you to say, I'm going to go research all the metrics of my data and my business, show it to somebody so that I'm accountable to them, at least outwardly. Um, I think that's super healthy. Yeah. And I, I would, if you're not, not already doing this, I would recommend you, you look back at what did you say you were like, you're on today. You say, these are the 10 things I'm going to try to accomplish in the next 30 days. And just go back and look, did, is it, did it get done or did it not get done? Yeah. And why? Yeah. Hold yourself accountable. That, it, it, there's reasons why those things might not get done, but um, there's a really good level of accountability. And I actually am on, not, not your list, but there are a couple of people who send me an update on their business, somewhat unsolicited. I actually read it because it's, it's interesting to me. And so I, I would suspect that your people might be reading it and they don't ask, but I frequently provide feedback and just you know, either, either, Hey, high five, looks like things are going well. Or if I see something that they didn't highlight in their update and they're under no obligation, I'm not an investor in these businesses. It's just like a, you know, they're looking for feedback or they want to hold themselves accountable. I like saying, Hey, I I read the update. All looks great. Did you think about X? So I don't know if you get that feedback from your 
your email list or your stakeholders, Craig, but I think that's a great idea for accountability, yeah. especially for a single entrepreneur. No, I get the same couple of assholes every month <laughs> <laughs> that send me unsolicited advice. No, it's, it's really helpful because I mean, I think part of, part of the trouble is, and someone said this to me is like, they can share, they could be the shoulder you can lean on even if it's virtually and once a month for five minutes or whatever, but just to know, okay, this person cares and they're thinking about my business and the, you know, the well being of it and everything. Uh, so that when we're in the, the doldrums of, you know, the, the bootstrap roller coaster, it's not all alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, and it is lonely. I mean, I'm, I'm very blessed to have a big team now, but four years ago, it's just me and it can be really lonely working on something that the, the rest of the world may or may not seem to care about. So I think that's another good, just, yeah. reach out, build those connections and have a relationship with somebody that understands what's going on in your work life. Yeah. We kind of have an informal version of this with Big Snow, Tiny Conf. We have a Slack and it's interesting over the years that Slack evolved from, hey, here's the place where we're going to talk about the logistics before the event to, hey, here's what I've been doing the past month. And I just wanted to update everybody on that. And you kind of end up getting that sort of uh, it's a little bit accountability, but a lot of the times it's just, hey, I want to bring this to the group. What do you guys all think of this? I'm thinking about doing X. Any thoughts on that? And so then everybody kind of piles in and says, hey, yeah, that sucks. Or, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe that's going to work. Or, hey, yeah, fuck yeah, rock on. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do it now. Why didn't you do it a month ago? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So, well, that yeah. group has a bit of skin in the game. To, I mean, not really, because they're not. you're not all financially tied in, but I would, I would expect that that community, Dave, has like almost like a um, inside obligation to help one another. Is that, is that the case? Because I, I think it, it's kind of like a mastermind for all intents and purposes. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a group of people that you've gotten to know each other's businesses and you've felt comfortable to share intimate details about those things like revenue and churn and secret plans and so on and so forth, location of your lair. Uh, and you just sort of work that stuff out over time and everybody, you know, comes to the next year and shares, okay, here's what happened the last 12 months. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's a little, it's, it's more like a mastermind than, you know, the unsolicited thing, but it still has the same kind of feel, right? So you're sending out the emails to this group of people. You're, it, you're kind of turning them into an informal mastermind at that point. If you're willing to share that some level of accountability, right? Yeah. Well, I think whatever, whatever the, the way is, I, the big message I think is tell people how you're doing what's going well, what you're struggling with. Hopefully you find a, a small network of people who care. You're not just, you know, blasting random strangers and, you know, trim the list. If people aren't actually helpful or not ever providing feedback, like they don't need the update. But if you can find a core group of people that will give you advice, it, it just makes a lot of things easier, I think. Yeah, yeah. So in the building of this 32 company now down to 27 portfolio of businesses here. What have been some unexpected things that you've come across? Like you didn't think it was going to turn out this way, but it did. And it was good. Uh, I think the people in the business, what is the most pleasant surprise and not, not, you know, I've had other jobs where I was able to recruit really talented people. And I told you my approach, like I always try to hire people smarter than me, which I unfortunately see is a path that too many people don't go down. I think, you know, the, the history of business will prove that, that my approach, and it's not like my idea, but I, I think that's the right approach. But what I didn't really plan for, but it's been a really present, pleasant surprise is how talented the teams are that come with businesses. And that, you know, of course, the people always have a choice, but you know, if I offer to somebody the same, you know, the same work or more challenging and the same pay or more, and you get to be a part of a bigger organization where there are other opportunities, people always say yes. And they'll at least give us a chance to see if they like working for us as much as they liked working for the founder. But what has been the, uh, a really pleasant surprise, and it's specific to bootstrapped companies, it, and I, I, I assume you guys would connect with this, but let me know if you disagree. If someone is funding a business themselves and they're paying rent or feeding their family or both or funding their travel, whatever, whatever the money is going toward, if the profits of a business are funding their personal life, they're going to generally run it pretty lean or at the appropriate level of investment. They're not going to overhire or waste money on 
roles that they don't necessarily need. But just as importantly, people that aren't a fit don't last long. So when I first started acquiring businesses that had teams of you know two to five people, I thought, well, we're first 90 days, let's go in and assess like, are these people in the right role? Are they smart? Are they talented? Are they going to work hard? And I quickly re- learned that wasn't a big concern because um, if somebody is running a lean business and they're feeding their family with the profits of that business, they're not going to let somebody who's not pulling their weight stick around. And so um, that's part of why we have this amazingly talented group of 80 people around the world is that the founders and the bootstrappers who built their businesses have a very high threshold for, uh, or they have very high expectations of talent and delivering on value. And so when the people come to SureSwift, I just assume they're awesome and until, until proven otherwise. So that was a, a bit of a pleasant surprise, I think, as you put it, Dave. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a, not surprising the way you explained it, but going into it, I don't know that I would have necessarily had that expectation, even though that would be the way I would run my own business. Like I wouldn't hire idiots and I have a very low threshold for bullshit. And if you're not contributing, you're not going to be on my team for long, you know, mm-hmm. but knowing that that's true across 27 businesses, I think that that says something that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is shockingly consistent across 27 businesses, the, the level of high performing talent that um, have, have, are, are in these businesses. So yeah, it's been a, been a pleasant surprise. Kevin, one of the things that you are uh, really clear about, and I applaud you for it, is you are a portfolio of businesses that buy and hold for the long term, uh, these technology enabled or online businesses. Um, as opposed to, I know there are people kind of in similar spaces that uh, are acquirers, builders, growers, and flippers of businesses. And I think, and I will be perfectly candid, uh, a, a huge like kind of life goal of mine is to have a really successful business and exit someday. I think it would just be kind of personally fulfilling and stroke my ego a little bit to say like, you know, I sold this business for millions of dollars or whatever. And you and I talked about this privately a couple of months ago, but now I'm thinking, I look at guys like the base camp guys uh, who are just running a business and they're going to run it forever, right? For, for, For their entire professional life, probably. And that's pretty sweet too, because they're making, I don't know, millions of dollars of profit a year. And that's not bad either, either. Um, can you talk about like how you, how you you came up with the thesis of you know buying and holding these technology businesses where things change a lot in the say, well, say SaaS or online world, and, and you guys are comfortable navigating that change and not planning on selling on a regular basis? I don't know there's a lot of questions there, but just love to hear kind of your thoughts around buying and holding these kind of businesses. Yeah. Um, so the the thesis from the beginning was just. So I, I have some friends, for whatever reason, Minneapolis seems to be um, rich with private equity people. And I, I've talked to a number, and more like, um, I don't consider ourselves a private equity business for in what you've just described, Craig, is one of those reasons I describe this as a holding company, because private equity kind of connotes, raise a fund, deploy the fund, liquidate the fund, rinse, repeat. Um, so it's very different than what we're doing. But one guy in particular told me, and he he works for a really big company that's really successful, kind of a brand name. And he's like, you know, it's kind of stupid. We, we find, we, like, we put all this effort into these companies and we build them up. And then the one jewel of the portfolio, you have to sell to pay off the fund when any sensible person would just hold that company and keep, you know, making the cash mm-hmm. flow from it. Um, and we had already been going down this, um, you know, buy and hold approach, but, you know, me and my partners just decided like, this is what we're going to do. And I I would love to tell you that we spent like, I personally spent like days and weeks coming up with a quote unquote investment thesis. And that's all, that's bullshit. We just kind of said, let's, here's this idea. Let's go try this, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) hold my beer. I'm going to go buy some companies and buy and hold and let's figure it out. Um, (laughs) I don't think that's what the meme is for Kevin. (laughs) Oh, well, whatever. I'm not very good at memes. Um, (laughs) I suck at memes, (laughs) but you know, another, another thing that I thought of when you were describing that, Craig, is like, and not, not necessarily recalling a specific conversation you and I had, but well, let's take the Basecamp guys, because they're very outward about their, you know, we're going to hold this company forever and proud of that. And I think it's cool. It's admirable. And with a company as successful as theirs, making 
making as much money. Why, why wouldn't you? But if somebody came and offered them a ridiculous amount of money and they sold, I guarantee you the parts of the internet would melt down because they've been so adamant that they're going to hold it forever. And I would look at it and say, well, hey, good for them. They changed their mind. And I think that's okay to change your mind. I think it's okay for somebody to be building a company for an exit. I think that's wonderful that people have that economic opportunity. And I think it's also okay for somebody to buy or build a business and, and hold it forever. Or you don't even have to do the work, like pay somebody else to do the work and, and you can kind of do whatever you want. I think, I think I, while I think it's good for people like um, Jason and DHH to be very uh, forceful in their discussion about what they believe, uh, it, and I, I don't, I, I'm not putting this on them, like it, it sort of paints you in a corner that you have to believe that forever. And I just don't, I don't agree that that's the case. I think people are people and, you know, well, the way I feel today of, and let's, I'll use me as an example. We're a buy and hold firm, period. And I want to do this. I'm not going to be as adamant as the base camp guys, but perfectly happy to do this for the next 10 years. But you know what? If I'm a guest on your podcast in five, five years and all of a sudden I've sold the whole portfolio or sold a chunk of it, like it's because something changed either in my brain or in the business environment. And that happens. So I, I just think um, we expect people to know what they want to do and stick to that forever. And I, I think that's completely unreasonable. So, you know, Craig, build these two businesses and exit and, you know, hold up a trophy at the next microconf and tell people how awesome you are. <laughs> Sweet. Go, go do that. Or if you want to hold them forever and, you know, just have an awesome cash flow, that's cool too. If you want to take another run at buying a company and do a portfolio. Sweet. Uh, that's a great. I applaud you for that. I think, um, especially in the, in the world of the internet where there's a bit of anonymity, people are a little too judgy about what other people are doing. I, mm. I like to have the edit. Like I got enough shit to worry about myself. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time worrying about what other people are doing. Yeah, no, I think the, the reason I ask is I, I think the, the immediate allure of selling a business and getting a big old check is great, but the difficulty of getting to a you know six or seven figure business is massive, and if you've done it once, to think you can do it again is, uh, for me, uh, potentially dangerous. Uh, and and to to look at an existing solid growing business and think you can sell it and go do that again is a really risky thing. And so I've moved a little bit from like, I have these two businesses that are growing and doing well and all this kind of stuff. And if I can sell them, I could just go do it again at a bigger scale. And that's potentially not the case. Uh, so I'm, I'm more in the, how can I set these businesses up to run forever and be profitable and start to run themselves and all these kind of things. Uh, and, and maybe selling is something that happens down the road, but in the meantime, they're wonderful businesses to run and provide for my family and stuff. So it's a, it's a yeah. spectrum for sure. A good, a good business to sell is also a good business to run. Right on. And uh, it, is, it is difficult to do once, let alone twice. Another thing that is slightly a different angle on that is, um, especially in the you know, solopreneur bootstrap community, businesses are our identity to some degree. And like, oh, yeah. I like to think of myself as a husband and father first, but you know, pretty quick, like my, you know, a big chunk of my life was spent on sure Swift. And so I've seen a number of people like get to a point where they, they feel like they want to sell all, they've got a great business, they get the great exit and that's all wonderful. And that, but then like, like they don't know what they're going to go do next or they, they have an idea, but that doesn't pan out. And some of their identity is lost. And that, that doesn't mean that they're, that that's a failure, but it's something that I think people should think about. Not that you have to have it all figured out. It's totally fine. Well, um, one person who sold us a business just decided they were going to go walk the earth for a while and have no plan. And it's totally cool. And the, 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 this, this person, I won't name their name unless, unless uh, I'll have them on my podcast and then you can kind of refer back to it. But it, it's, it's a home run for this individual. There's other people that they would go crazy if they didn't have a plan or something to work on or a, another piece of their identity. And that's something that I don't, I don't know that people talk about a lot. Uh, or at least I don't hear it a lot. Is you know, in that some one other uh, thing that I found uh, back to Dave's question earlier, the reasons people sell businesses are rarely rarely is finances the number one reason. It's usually something other than finances that they're tired. They don't want to manage a team of people. 
they're out of ideas, they want to go do the next project, et cetera, you know, they're, they're getting married, they're having a kid, there's a, some life event that is, that is going on. And it, it's rarely, I want to get to X monthly profit so I can get Y exit. And that, you know, once they hit that number, then a, a switch flips and they're ready to sell. My experience is that is not usually the case. Yeah, I think, Kevin, is there anything else you wanted to, to touch on? No, I just appreciate the, I've been fans, you guys know, I've been a fan and a listener for a while. So it's been a pleasure to be on the podcast with you and chat uh, to both of you at the same time on, on our recording. Miracle, miracle. <laughs> Something that hasn't happened at a microconf in ages since Craig and I have never been able to coalesce at the same microconf at the same oh, time. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, the only conference we've ever been to together is Rhodium. Not true. I came right? to MicroConf uh, three years ago. God, it makes me so old. In mm-hmm. Vegas? Yep. What? No, because we would have done a podcast episode then. Uh, we did. We did. It was a terrible one, but just you like guys, all the rest of us. <laughs> you sound like me and my wife trying to recall events from the past. Uh, yeah, and I know. I, of course we did. Furthermore, it sounds like did. Craig is the wife and, and he's correct. I know I'm correct. We, no. I remember exactly what where it was. It was terrible. It was, like, it was in a nightclub. That's like the perfect place to record a podcast. A <laughs> nightclub in Vegas. <laughs> Yeah, see, I'm the I'm the old cranky guy lawn, then. Right? So the, yeah. yeah, get yeah. off my lawn. I, my memory's fading already. I'm who the That's hell are you funny. guys and why are That's you here? Funny. Yeah. Uh Kevin, no, thank you so much for uh for coming on the show. Uh for folks who like want to learn more about Sure Swift uh and, and kind of reach out and learn more about I, I either like running a large remote portfolio business or you know folks that potentially want to sell their businesses what would be a good place to kind of reach out and learn more about uh, what you guys do yeah so sureswiftcapital.com you can subscribe we're investing a lot in our own content uh trying to tell our story and answer some of these common questions uh i'm kevin at sureswiftcapital.com happy to receive emails from anybody to talk about any of this stuff um and you can find me on Twitter, Kevin underscore McArdle, M-C-A-R-D-L-E. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Yeah. Good to talk with you guys. Thanks. Thanks for listening to another episode of Rogue Startups. If you haven't already, head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the show. For show notes from each episode and a few extra resources to help you along your journey, head over to roguestartups.com to learn more.